work for today's, but uh, after today it will. But if you look at the other meetings, there are these pictures that link to, um, I made a YouTube channel and I've just uploaded the videos to the YouTube channel. I haven't edited them or anything. That takes quite a lot of time. So uh, the videos will be available online on the YouTube channel. What I think I will probably eventually do is use that YouTube channel to, um, especially for the boot camp, is to record these lectures in a more formal way and also to record uh, the scripts uh, when I do the coding in a, in a formal way. <clears throat> um, are there any comments or anything before we, we begin today? Any questions or comments? What I plan to do today is to carry on with the boot camp. Um, today it's boot camp 1.3. Uh, here are the links for everything, the markdown slides, HTML slides. I'll go through those first. The uh, link to the page, which we'll look at in just a moment before I launch into the slides. The script template, which I'll, uh, I'll remind you about when we do the live coding. And then a script that goes through all of the script, and I'll do as much of that as we can in the hour today. First, let's look at the uh, boot camp page. So this uh, topic is on data objects, and uh, just like the other pages, there are clickable links and some things for you to read. And I intend for you, when you uh, go through this in your own time, to literally type in the code. I think that's better than um, copying and pasting the code. You'll learn more. And to read through it on your own time. So today, I'm going to go through that with you, and I'm just going to start with the slides. OK. <clears throat> so today the uh, topic is um, data objects. And um, you know I like a good metaphor. And last time the metaphor that we talked about was the metaphor of, um, of the passive aggressive butler in R. So uh, as an entity that does work for you behind the scenes, the passive aggressive butler Will often when you issue a command will help you, but sometimes if you are not very precise with your command, uh, it may do something that is unintended. So it may be a little devious. So you have to be careful when you interact with the passive aggressive butler. Also, sometimes if you do something that doesn't make sense, you will get an error message. Um, and you know it's up to you to figure out how to communicate with the butler. Uh, the error message, there's a learning curve to understanding what the error messages mean. And the worst case scenario is you ask the butler to do some work and you've asked a, a bad question. You've asked a wrong question, but the passive aggressive butler goes ahead and does it anyway and, and doesn't give you an error message. So we have to be careful of that. The metaphor today is the metaphor of our space. And uh, I'll, I'll mention this metaphor today a few more times and going on into the future of the boot camp, I'll refer to it. And I find this one to be another one that is an issue when you begin to learn to use a programming language, any programming language, uh, and especially a programming language where you're going to be um, doing things with data. The issue with our space is and what the metaphor means, let me unpack it with you just briefly, is that uh, when we're working with data and computers, and especially when there's a scripting language and there isn't a, a graphical user interface or there isn't a, um, a visual manifestation uh, to represent the, the data, like in a spreadsheet, we have to work conceptually. And our space is the conceptual space in, in memory where the data are stored. Okay, so that's my metaphor for, uh, for where data objects are stored, R space. And the metaphor goes like this, that when you start a new R session, uh, the way that I like to invite you, new users, to think about data objects is that you're floating in R space 
And when you start a new session, you're all alone. You can't see any data anywhere around you, no matter which direction you look. But when you read in a data set, or when you start working with individual data objects that you want to do work on, that you want to convert to information, then in our space, conceptually, you can see a box containing that object. So that's what we're going to start to talk about today. Today, we'll talk about small objects, small boxes floating around in our space with us that we'll be able to see and manipulate. The small objects might be a, a little box that just contains a single value. It might be a, a box that contains multiple values, multiple observations of the same data type. This might be something like um, uh, a length measurement on different individuals. Um, we might have a um, something that has columns and uh, rows that go this way. So that's a little bit like a spreadsheet. And that might be a, a, a data frame. It might be a data object. We're going to talk about that next week. Or it might be a matrix that has rows and columns. So we'll talk about arrays, vectors, and matrices today. Um, and we'll introduce the idea of our space. Now, one of the annoying things, I think, when you start to use R on a serious level is uh, you have to contend with this idea that um, there are there are types of data that are in your mind, but you have to make sure that the computer recognizes those types of data uh, as as objects unto themselves that have particular properties. And you have to make sure that you agree with the passive aggressive butler as to what type or what class of data object that you're working with. This is actually one of the uh, fundamental uh, issues with using R that I think um, beginners, when they first start, you, you can just jump it right in and start using R. That's why it's so fun and easy to use um, to get started. But these little details come back to haunt you. OK, so there are some some basic data types uh, in R. And we're going to look at how to um, observe and take responsibility for for what those uh, those types of data are classified as in R. There's a function called str that uh, stands for structure. We can use structure on any kind of data object, and it, if it's a data frame, especially, we'll use it more next week. But it allows us to to uh, visually inspect the um, the kind of data structures that have been read in, say, from a data set. Factors are a special case. Data with factors are something that, um, if you're doing statistics, if you've done an experiment, you definitely will have factors. And there are different kinds of factors, so we'll talk a little bit about them. The class function is an important one because um, it allows us to see the, the variable type or the variable class that has been assigned by R. And uh, sometimes, uh, let's say that you have a, an experiment and you have a level that you've called control in your data set, and then you've got um, some different levels. Uh, 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 Xi Jing, I don't see her in the uh, chat here, but I was just chatting with her and her supervisor over some emails about their, their experiment. They had a one level called ABA, which was kind of a a control, and they had some other levels that were increasing. They had a 0 AT, a 2 AT, and a 6 AT that were increasing concentrations. Now, those variables, they had a particular order. So we have factors that um, sometimes are ordered factors, or we might have unordered factors. And uh, if you read in, if you merely read in data, and you've given your factor levels a name, are the passive aggressive butler is likely to read them in as character strings, but they're not character strings. And behind the scenes, the linear algebra that is allowing us to analyze ANOVAs and our um, linear models is converting those those character strings into um, into numeric values, dummy variables. Now, this is all getting into the stats part of it, and I don't intend to do that today. And I think my point 
in that example was to say that um, if you have if you have a, a variable that is um, read in as a, a character string variable, but it is actually a factor, we might need to convert it to have full control over what is happening when we're going to do some statistics. And so we'll talk about just scratching the surface just to make you aware of how to convert variables in R. And then finally, we'll talk about the uh, variable type types, the um, vectors and matrices that we always will start using, uh, even from the very early days of our use. Now, um, if we go to that R space metaphor, data objects are just storage containers, and the containers themselves are floating around in R space with us in an R session. And each of those those containers we can see has a name. Um, yeah, there's a comment in there, Prishmek. Uh, that's right. Version four of R handled factors in a fundamentally different way than um, than uh, earlier versions. And now I've been using it, you know, as I do on a day-to-day -day basis for hours a day. I've even forgotten the details of the change. <laughs> But you're exactly right. It does. Uh, it doesn't do some of the automatic things. They defuse the passive aggressive butler. <laughs> Maybe we'll come back to that when we talk about data um, data frames next week. But our um, we can think of in our space whether it's a a factor that the the butler has done something to, or or it's just something simple like a, a container that contains just a single numeric variable. I think of those containers in our space as um, little boxes, and the little boxes have their name written on them. That's the metaphor of our space. And so uh, we could make a, a container with just a single numeric integer um, that's, that is uh, classed in, um, in our space by the passive aggressive butler. He would class that as a numeric. And it, in this case, it would be an integer numeric. Um, if we use the combined function, like we did last week, to just make some decimal values, now what if we combine those two values? That would also be a numeric, but now it wouldn't just be a, a box with a single value, it would be a vector that has, has two values, and there could be any number of values in a vector like that. We could also make a character vector with some character strings. Now I've put actual names of, of people there, but these could be the names of your factor levels or or some other kind of character string and we can have a vector of character strings now the the butler would recognize all of these simple ones factors are the ones that we'd have to play with Ooh, this uh, picture is unfortunately too small but uh, when we get to the code part <clears throat> what i'll do is i'll uh, run this code and we'll read in some examples of some vectors and we'll we'll look at the at the class and um, uh, just have a peek at how the butler handles that. Another thing we'll do when we get into the R Studio um, part of today is um, when you read in, when it, those variables are created with the previous code chunk, I used to um, really lean on this, this concept of R space when I began teaching with R, because when I began teaching with R, R Studio wasn't around and very popular then like it is today. So R itself, the plain program R, has a very basic um, graphical user interface. And they don't have a visible representation of the global environment in there. But um, now I still find the um, concept of R space useful, but there is a visual representation of our space, and it's called the global environment. So we'll look at that uh, in the live coding today. The global environment, there are lots of options here, but by default, it's in the upper right hand um, pane of, of our studio. You can change those windows around if, if you really want to do that for some good reason, but um, by default, it's in the upper right hand corner. There are a couple of tabs up there. And uh, what the global environment will do is it will actually order order um, values 
that are that are merely containers for variables uh, in a values section. And if you read in data objects or other kinds of structured data objects, it will categorize them and, and keep them separate visually. So it, it in, enforces some order on what is otherwise purely conceptual, purely abstract um, data structures that are in the computer memory. It's pretty useful. So we'll have a look at that. <coughs> now, what do you name these um, these data objects? Well, you can you can actually. Uh, I like to start off by saying you can name them anything, anything you want to. You can name them with the uh, characters, but there are some rules that constrain uh, what you can name them. So your variable name can contain letters, numbers, and some symbols, some symbols like dashes and underscores. Uh, every variable that you make must begin with a letter. That's one rule. Uh, every variable you make must not contain any spaces. Now this is a rule, but you can cheat this rule. I'm not going to tell you at the moment how to cheat it, but you can actually get around this rule if you must. And I have come across a few instances where I had to get around this rule to do things in the easiest way. But a general rule is that it must not contain spaces. If you need a space to make a variable name more readable, the traditional way to do it is to make an underscore. There are some other ways as well, like snake case. Like if you had a variable called uh, my data, um, snake case would have a the lowercase m y and then when the next word human word begins you'd capitalize just that so it would be lowercase m y capital d lowercase a t a so you just give you a visual cue when you read it in human uh, that the different words were there but it, it's easier most people find it easier I find it easier and it's best practice in fact it's official R syntax when you're naming variable names that are long to use an underscore between words. So my underscore data, that's the official syntax. So no spaces, no forbidden characters. Oh, there are all sorts of forbidden characters that you mustn't use. You mustn't use the forbidden characters. These are things like math operators, like plus, minus, divide, things like that. The percent sign is the, uh, the caret sign is uh, expo exponent. The at symbol is forbidden. The hash symbol is forbidden. There, are, there are a bunch of them. If in doubt, just don't use special characters. But you can, you can experiment with this yourself. All variable names should be human readable. They should be some. They should use consistent syntax. If you read other people's scripts, I guess if you're really a glutton for punishment, you could read R Studios guide to uh, syntax or Google also has an R um, guide to R syntax. You could read those, but, but actually it's easier. You don't have to read and memorize somebody else's rules. Just be consistent. Make a rule for yourself that's easy for you to read. Remember, we're always writing our script for some other person, maybe somebody we haven't been able to um, to explain our code to, somebody that we respect, somebody that we're maybe a little afraid of. So be consistent on their behalf. Don't make your character, your uh, variable names too long either. That just makes awkward scripts that are hard to read. Finally, they're case sensitive. Most things are case sensitive in the, um, the R world, like package names, um, function names, and certainly uh, variable names are as well. So um, lo uh, if you had a, a data object called data, all lowercase, D-A-T-A, -A, it would be different in our space to a data object called capital D lowercase ATA. Um, so case sensitive. Factors are a special case. This there's actually a lot going on with factors. You could view it as being a lot of, a lot to learn, but the way that I like to view it is that um, factors are a very powerful um, data object and we we often want to have and need to have complete control over what's going on with factors so that we have complete control over what's going on with a statistical analysis. So um, I think my best advice for this is to uh, if, if some of the ideas that we go over with factors is very new to you um, that 
you you wait until you really need to to understand factors to invest in learning about factors you'll remember it better when you need to use it but having said that two things you do need to know are whether an actor uh, a factor must be ordered so an example of something that must be ordered would be the days of the week uh, or the um, months of the year and there's a particular order that go to them non-ordered factors might be the names of um, places or the names of people or um, types of you know food you like to eat uh, another ordered kind of factor might be the the order someone finishes a race both of those types we often want to exploit the order of factors in in statistical analysis either to control uh, specific comparisons that we make um, like with contrasts I mentioned contrast because I noticed Xi Jing just uh, just joined us hello Xi and um, you might want to um, uh, control the order because of that and often a reason you might want to control the order is to graph it so that you don't have a silly ordering on um, on a graph where you are representing your data so generally we need to think about that when we're analyzing data. Okay, the last thing is the class function, and we'll look at this uh, in the live coding. Now, this is the function where you can, uh, and I like to do this a lot. This is another little thing I like to say, is that uh, you know I'm, I often may have an idea in my mind about how the world works, and then I want to compare it to some evidence for how the world works and see if they match. And then if I'm wrong, it allows me to update what I think is going on. The class function is a little bit like that. I might have in my mind that I, you know, I've got this factor. I'm going to do some analysis with the factor. I've got a control level in the factor, and I want to compare everything else to the control level. That's how I want the word world to work. Well, I can use the class function to examine whether the passive aggressive butler agrees with me that the world works that way. I often use class if I'm in doubt, and, and sometimes we have to um, take control and take responsibility for the uh, way that, that our variables are stored. So we'll use that quickly to uh, just examine some variables, and I'll, I'll probably quickly in the live code show you how to, um, to alter some variables too. Last thing we'll look at in the uh, live code is we will look at um, um, three structures that we use all the time. Vectors are just uh, long, linear. We, th we can think of them as having a row or an address to store variables. A matrix stores um, variables in uh, exactly two dimensions, columns and rows, if you want to think of it like that way. But we needn't think of them as columns and rows. We're a little bit trained to think of data sets like that because of the spreadsheets. But um, it maybe we could allow ourselves to think a little more abstractly about arrays uh, or matrices rather uh, when we start to think about arrays. Now, arrays are n-dimensional. We can have arrays that have a very large number of dimensions, but the easiest one to think about would be a three-dimensional array. Now, a three-dimensional array has might have columns, rows, but it has another dimension, depth. Um, an example of this, so uh, I see Joseph in the um, in the house here. Is Joseph just sent me a, a ridiculously large data file that contains um, uh, x and y coordinates and one layer uh, for each of um, of, uh, I think 128 or some something close to that, uh, different um, spectra that were taken by a multi-spectral camera. And so that's an array of data that all belongs to the same um, to the same unit and it has to be arranged spatially. This would be a perfect application for an array. So we'll talk about those. And without further ado, we're just going to slide over to uh, the live code. I'm going to go quickly back to the um, the main page. If you're going to follow along with this, I do encourage you to set up to do it. And if you if you'd like to listen, that's fine. Listen and watch. That's fine, too. 
But when you go through this on your own to practice, and I highly recommend you do that, you'll get more out of this if you if you do that on your own time. There's this script template, and I'm just going to remind you what that looks like by opening it in my own R. My script template. I'm just going to remove everything from my from my um, my R environment here, so we start fresh. <clears throat> we can see the template. And when you start doing this, um, this is a template I showed you last week. It's got a fresh link to the same file. This is how you want to start every one of your own scripts. It's just best practice. You would replace the contents with um, see it, Prismac. You can replace the contents with the uh, contents of your own script. So if we go back real quick to this, I've already got a script set up for today for the bootcamp 1.3. So I'm just going to open that up. <clears throat> and you can see that I've edited the baseline script to put in my own, you know, who's doing the editing, what's the content of the script, and the last date that I edited the script. And I've changed the contents to um, be in the format where I've got different sections that correspond to each of the sections for the bootcamp. Okay, so I'll put the code that corresponds to each of those sections in its respective section. And if I click up here on this little pane or down here in the clickable contents, I'm gonna I'm gonna some I've been clicking on the index up here to show you my index. You can see that I have a clickable section for each of these content pages, and then I have some indented ones for subsections. So it's quite nice, but I'm gonna use this one today. So if we look at the setup, what have I done in setup? All I've done in setup is um, I have um, uh, I still have the old link in this because I recycled my script for this. <clears throat> All I have here is some placeholder code for you to set your working directory with that that uh, syntax that I showed you last time. So um, for this code, if we just look at the um, bootcamp page real quick, the idea is to read this and get to the first code and type this in. And uh, again, just being explicit, the way that um, the way that I intend this to be is I, I might do it side by side, or if you have two screens, you could do it one on each screen. But uh, I'm just going to go through the code today that shows up in the um, in the main page. OK, so the first section here is the basic data types and the use of structure. Now, if we glance up here at the global environment, we're floating in our space. We can't see any boxes, any containers that have data structures, and we can see in the global environment that there's nothing there as well. So. I think I'm floating in our space, and I think that there's nothing around me. I can test how the world works by looking at the global environment. <clears throat> Let's make a few variables. We're going to make a new ve ve vector called variable underscore one, a logical ve vector called variable two, and a character vector with some names uh, called variable three. So I'm just going to make those, and uh, when I pop these. I'm going to do them one at a time. One, two, three. And they'll pop up in the global environment. So keep your eyes over there. Here we go. Three, two, one. One, two, three. So there they are. We can inspect them um, up here and we get a little bit of information just at a glance. We know that this is in the values section of the global environment. We can see the variable one is numeric and that there are um, one to 14 values. So a total of 14 is the length of the numeric vector for variable one. Variable two is a logical vector of length four. Variable three is a character vector of length three. And we can see the first few values of each of those as well, just to just to sort of give us a little more information. I, I will use structure next week, the structure, um, the str function. Let's see what happens if we um, use that on variable one. And uh, 
if we use the structure variable and variable one, we get something very similar to what we get up in the global environment. So if you have a lot going on in your global environment, there's still, even in the modern slick world of um, RStudio, we still might use that str function. Now, if we use the class function, remember the, what we use this for is just to um, confirm what type of variable we might be working for. And I'm just going to do this. The output will be down here in the console, and I'm going to do them all one, two, three. So you can look down on the console, three, two, one. And we just get the same information. It's just another way to quickly, with code, get the same information. For some reason, we might want to do that, especially if you have a lot going on in your global environment. So we do have a numeric, we do have a logical, and we do have a character. Again, we can just sort of get a little glimpse of that up there. <clears throat> now, um, what about naming variables? So this is a code block that um, that is one of the try this code blocks. By try this, I, I suggest that you type it in. So we can make a variable name called x1, put the, uh, make it a numeric container with the, the number five, and that's all okay. And we could say x1, I'm just going to type it down in the console. And when we invoke the name of a container we see in our space with us, we um, get the contents displayed down in the console. We can also see it, of course, up in the global environment. x2, it's a character um, vector. It was a dark and stormy night. Now, um, no problem. The the name works. We've got a starts with a letter. It's short. I, I don't actually I don't like that name for a real character because or for a real um, container for data <clears throat> because it doesn't mean anything. X2. You can't guess that there's a string in that that vector. So that's even though it technically works, it's a pretty bad name for a for a variable. What about this one? My variable nine two eight three four six seven and we just put the value one in there. Well, this variable works because it um, it uses the official syntax to separate letters. It's it's called my variable. It's got that long number, but it's kind of hard to read. We don't know what that number means. It's also quite long. This, this is the absolute longest I would ever want a variable to, to read. The reason I don't like long variables, and in fact, it's bad practice to use long variables, is when you have a lot of long variable names in code, it's quite hard to read them. It's, it's quite hard to read the code. You can't read it quickly. You have to really pay attention and focus on it to, to get the meaning from it. So it's best to make the shortest variable names possible. OK, they must begin with a letter. So we can um, put a character vector in a um, vector name called varieties. We can print out varieties, three, two, one, down in the console. We get our varieties. That's no problem. We could put a variable called x432. We get it. We can print it. No problem. 22 catch. Oh, doesn't like that. We get an error, unexpected symbol in 22 catch. Doesn't tell us, the passive aggressive butler doesn't tell us but the symbol is that we can't begin a, a character name with a with a number. Also, it must not contain spaces. So my underscore variable, that's just fine. My dot variable, that's fine. My variable in snake case, it's fine. Well, those work, okay. But we can't have the forbidden symbols. We can't have the at symbol. Nope, um, error, object my not found. So it's kind of doing something. The butler's message there is a bit funny. What does the butler's message mean? It is trying to look for an object in, in our space called my. And the at symbol, it's not recognizing as the name of a variable name that we want to assign to it. So it gives us this funny message. We have to interpret what the butler is telling us. Um, m dash var. Also, object my dot found. What what it, the butler is interpreting this as is uh, we might want to subtract 
the something some variable called var from some variable called my and then do something else so it's confused uh, m equal to there now ooh, look it, it didn't get us give us a uh, warning there and uh, here what it's done is it's made some variables up there this is this is classic passive aggressive butler it's done something completely different than what we wanted because we've broken the naming conventions all right uh, I don't use this often, but I have recently used it in some some of my own scripts where I've been doing a lot of data manipulations. But some of these variables are just look. If we scroll now, we've got quite a lot of them floating around in R space with us. Now the only constraint we have to R space is um, the memory. R R does a funny thing. It it's very fast doing math and doing statistics. And one of the reasons it's very fast is it uses fast memory doesn't store data objects on the hard drive, doesn't store data objects in long-term storage, it stores them in random access memory, RAM. That's the fastest memory that we have on computers these days. Um, but sometimes we have a lot of variables and it, it just confuses things. It takes up namespace, so we get a variable with one name and maybe we have a lot of similar names and it's just hard to read the script or maybe it's actually taking up space in our memory and we don't want it to take up space in memory. It's actually best practice to take up as little space as possible. We can get rid of some of these. I'm just going to get rid of the one called my and the one called ver. And the, the way we do that is with the RM uh, function stands for remove and we can put a vector of variable names in there. I'm also going to get rid of the snake case my variable. Notice how when I um, type the first few letters, I get this pop up. It's the thing that our studio does. It sometimes it irritates me, but sometimes I use it. So you, you can either click on that or you can just hit enter. Uh, if I get rid of my dot, oops, need to put a comma in there. My dot. And I can scroll with my arrow keys, but I want the my dot variable. I could I could go crazy and get rid of all of these. Usually, if you are doing data manipulations, I might include a, an rm command at the end of a data manipulation script to do my data manipulations, load my memory up with all those temporary variables, and then remove them all when I don't need them anymore. So if I execute line 74, and you look over here in the um, global environment, you'll see a few of those variables disappear. I'm going to do it now. Three, two, one. There they go. So now I'm, I'm down those variables and it's just removed them. It's never really any cost to remove these variables either. Some people like to keep them just in case I might need them. But remember the R system, if you, if you um, use your script as a document, of variable manipulation, of data manipulation. You can always get your, your data objects back just with a line of code when you need them. So it's nice to think abstractly. I have another metaphor. It's uh, it's sort of thinking with jujitsu. You know, you're, you're stepping aside and you're pulling in the data just when you need it and then you push it away. Um, but we'll come back to that one when we're doing some statistics. All right. So uh, best practice is that the um, variable name should be human readable, not too long, and they should be consistent. So what if you did diameter breast height uh, underscore centimeters? That's very, very clear what's going into that. It's some measurements probably on a tree. A standard measurement on tree is the diameter of the tree at breast height in centimeters. So this is very explicit. So we could make that variable three, two, one. There it is. It's a numeric, link five. Now that's a legal name. It's very clear. It's a bit too long. It's a bit too long for my personal style. What about dbh underscore cm? That's a lot better. It's a lot better to me. Case sensitive. We have height. We're going to make some heights. OK, no problem. But then if I go and I ask the butler, show me what's in height. With a capital H, um, I get error. But if I do it with the lowercase, 
it's going to show us the data down here in the console. Three, two, one. There we go, no problem. So case sensitive. All right, um, data with a factor. I think there's just something to read on the web page there. There's no code for that one. I'm going through this kind of quick, so just yell. Uh, I think this is some basic stuff. And I realize for some of you, you already probably have seen this stuff before. But for other people, they may be just learning. So just yell or stop me if anybody has a comment or a question. Or if you want me to go faster, indeed, I can go faster. Um, what I want to do is I want to make a non-ordered factor. We would, we would imagine this like you did an experiment. You had one factor called short. You had one factor called early. And you had one um, level called hybrid. And uh, I put three instances of each, which would be, they would correspond, if you were entering this into a spreadsheet, as a variety factor that uh, had three observations for each of those levels. So nine total observations for this. So let's go ahead and make that. Three, two, one. Variety pops up here. It's here. Um, so I've got short, 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 early, early, early hybrid, 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 same order that I then put them here. If I look at the class of variety, we can see up there in the uh, global environment that variety is identified as a character. We're just going to confirm that with the class function. Indeed, it's a character. Um, and if we print out then the variety, the character strings just get printed out. This is a classic case that we're, we're always in. I'm, I'm in this case several times a day when I'm analyzing data. So it's just second thought that right up, usually I put right up in the set. When I read in the data set, I'll glance up in the global environment. I'll identify the, the um, variables that I know should be classed as factors. And I'll go ahead and I'll use the factor function to convert the names of factor levels into what R recognizes as a factor character or a factor class. So if I use factor on my variety, it will convert the character vector into a, um, a factor class. And I'm just going to um, use factor on variety, and I'm going to put the results of that back in the same exact character name. It's very efficient because it destroys the old character vector and it makes the new factor. And Gustavo uh, raises a good point that there is another kind of um, function we could use here, just the same, called as.factor. That's the as.factor, as.numeric, as.character. All of those are made for converting characters. Yes, excellent. We will use the as. group of functions um, in the boot camp. But if we just look up here, keep your eye on variety and the character right there. I'm going to convert it to a factor. Three, two, one. Boom. It's uh, recognized now as a factor with three levels. The levels are the, the names. Let's just print this out down here in the console. Here it comes. Three, two, one. Now the output is completely changed. It's not giving us the uh, character vectors like it did before. Now it's, it's telling us the names of the factor levels and it gives us a levels output early hybrid short when i'm using data from somebody else which i often do one of the very first things i do is i'll um i'll convert obvious factors to factors and i'll print it out so that i can see what the levels are and one of the reasons i do that is look for typos people have introduced into spreadsheets especially if it's a big data set to look for like maybe there's a lowercase early and an uppercase early that will be treated as uh, separate factor levels. A classic one that I find all the time uh, is a space after a level. So there might be two earlies, but one has a space <laughs> that's been entered, maybe copied and pasted, and, and so it's mutated in the Excel spreadsheet. But this one comes out okay. What if we wanted to do an ordered factor? Well. Um, we could make a factor called day, pops up into the global environment. We could look at the class. Now it's just a character, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday. 
Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, now, if we make it a factor, <clears throat> now day is a factor with the four levels, and we, we kind of um, look at the class. Now it's a factor down in the console. And if we print the factor day, the levels are Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So it's um, put them into alphabetical order. That's the default ordering for for factors that are um, that are unordered that we haven't imposed an order on. <clears throat> so in order to um, explicitly set the order, we need to make it um, explicit. So there are several ways to do this. I'm just going to show one way. So we can look at um, remember if we want to um, do work with a function. Here are the work we want to do. Remember I said that one thing is to discover what function we want to do the work with and then learn how to use that function. So we know we're working with the factor function and we just want to get some help with it. What you can see is that there's a levels argument. And if we read down here what the levels argument does, it's an optional vector of the unique values for each level of your factor. Um, and uh, the default is is just the unique ones from a character vector. And um, they're sorted alphabetically or in numerically increasing order. And uh, we can set it specifically, though, um, different to just the uh, sorting by alpha numeric. So here we can exploit that levels factor. Now uh, we're just using the factor um, function again. We're setting x to uh, to our vector, which is just our day factor. That's just the one we just made. But here we're setting the levels explicitly. Our levels are Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday here in the console. Here we're setting them to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and imposing the order we want. Very useful if you have a control, for example, which you want listed first. So let's just do that. You can look up here. If you keep your eye here on the Thursday, when I submit this, three, two, one, change to Tuesday, because now when we print it, we get the order we want. Levels Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That is a top tip. You'll probably have to use it in the future if you're just starting to use R, but it's pretty good. All right, next section is vectors and matrices. So this is a try this section from the web page. Um, so first we're going to make a vector. Now this is pretty bad, bad form, you know, for a ve vector. And if we wanted to improve it, I'd probably call it something like this, my vec1 with underscores to make it easier for humans to read, but to be consistent with this, just as an example, and I'll leave it like that. So we're just going to make a numeric vector. It's just the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're going to print it out. Look down in the console when I submit just the word my vector. So 3, 2, 1. It just displays the contents of the box. Let's see what class it is. OK, so no, it's numeric, no problem. Now we can convert my vec with uh, this class of um, functions that Gustavo mentioned, the as dot functions, very powerful. So if you want to, if we want to convert the uh, numbers, the numeric integers one, two, three, four, five to characters, we could use the as character function. So that's going to convert them to double quotes, one, double quote two double quote three, etc. So let's just do that. Um, we're going to make a new variable to do that. It'll pop up just below my vec2 alphabetical in, in there. So if you want to watch that, three, two, one. We can see that it did that. It made a character with those characters, the, the numerals as characters. <coughs> so now when we print it, look down in the console, three, two, one. Just as we expected, 
and now we can see that the class as well is a character three, two, one. There we go. Now, um, <clears throat> now what is going to happen here? One of the things that I think is an underused um, thing when we're learning to use R is doing little experiments. Every line of code could be a little experiment. Unlike in the real world, a little experiment in R is, is almost free. It's fast and, and cheap to do. So what's going to happen to our vector when we pass two different kinds of data into a, a vector container? So we pass the numbers 2 and 3 and the character string male. Let's try it. Let's look up here. We can see it pop up right below vec my vec 2, 3, 2, 1. Oh, what's happened there? Let's print it out. It's going to go down to the console, 3, 2, 1. What's happened here is that uh, now we we ask the butler, butler, make me a vector that contains the numeric value 2, the numeric value 3, and the um, character string male. The butler said, well, that does not make any sense, sir. Didn't bother to tell us that. It just assumed we made a mistake. Now, there's a characteristic of vectors is that they have to, all, all the values in, in a vector have to contain the same kind of data. So the butler has uh, converted our two and three to um, characters. That's what has happened there. Now uh, we can convert our vector three to numeric using as.numeric. What happens there? We're going to put it in vector four. Ooh, here we get a, a warning. Now uh, let's see what's in there. So it says NAs were introduced by coercion. So here when we've asked the character values two and three to be converted to numbers, the butler has done that, but when it got to a character string male, it said, hey, wait a second, that's not a number. And so, so it's, um, it's uh, created a missing value. So that's as close as we could. There might be other ways around that, but that's what, what has happened. So you have to keep your eye on the butler. For matrices, <clears throat> this is our first, uh, everything. To now and fairly straight. I went out there for a second and it said it got me back in the meeting. Can people just confirm that they can hear me and see the video? Type a Y in the chat, please. Yeah, it's Am okay I back? now. It's okay now? Okay. I don't know why that went out. It, went, it might have been my end. Okay, so um, <clears throat> vectors are fairly straightforward. We can think of them like, like uh, a column in a spreadsheet, but matrices are a little more abstract. So I find that um, this takes a little more work, but they're very useful. And uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with matrices behind the scenes with math and statistics. So um, first we're going to make a vector called myVec1 with the numbers 1 to 16. We're just using the shorthand to create this vector. And we're going to print it out down in the console. 3, 2, 1, boom, boom. So that's our numeric vector. Now we're going to do something with a matrix function. We're going to create a matrix based on our vector one. We might want to get up the matrix help page. So in matrix, we've got our data by default set to NA. We've got the number of rows we want in our matrix. Remember, matrices have two dimensions, rows and columns. And uh, we use the square brackets for the little addresses to denote that. And uh, it's the number of the row address, comma, separated by the number of the column address. That's the um, way that matrices work. So we can set how many rows and how many columns. This is just the defaults for the usage set by default to one and one. If we use some data form that is a vector, let's say, the way that we populate the values of the matrix, um, by default, if we didn't change anything, this argument called by row is set to false. That means it's going to do it by columns. So um, 
we have to keep that in mind when we're making matrices too. And then there can be a um, a um, another vector, a character vector, or an, even a numeric vector set um, setting the value of the argument dim names. Those are dimension names. If we want to add some. Okay, so let's let's have a look at this. If I just bring this out just a little bit, <clears throat> what I see here is um, calling the matrix function. I'm going to set the data to vec1. It's just got the numeric values 1 to 16. Number of columns are going to be 4. By row is going to be set to false, so it's going to number it by columns. So uh, let's do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to print out the matrix. Now what I expect, again, this is a little experiment, a little game you like to play with R. I'm expecting the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, then by column 5, 6, 7, 8, and so forth, 1 to 16. So I'm going to submit it and print it down in the console. Look in the console, 3, 2, 1. So there it is. By row set to false sets and populates our matrix by column. You know, if I change this um, to say that it had uh, um, eight columns to the number of columns, I would expect one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth, and for there to be eight columns. Let's see what that does. I'm going to print the same matrix down in the bottom. Three, two, one. There we go. So it's just a little, that's just how it works. Now, we can use the call names to see what column names are contained in our variable. Well, we can see, I'm going to, I'm going to put this back to four for this example. Boom, boom. And if we ask it what the call names is, look down in the console, three, two, one. Well, there are no column names. I just, I, it just populated them numerically. But what we could do is we could actually this is a top tip that I just love this syntax. The call names function used on a data object, let's we're floating in, in R space. And on the outside of the box called mat one is printed its name, but along the line of the box are the column names for this matrix. There's nothing there at the moment, but we can put something into it with the call names function. So we're actually using the assignment operator to assign the letters A, B, C, D to these column names using the call names structure. So let's see what happens then. I'm going to print out the call names then. Now they're null. Three, two, one. Now the call names contains A, B, C, D. And if we print our matrix now, three, two, one, we have column names on our matrix. Now this is very useful um, for a lot of things. It, it's one of the things I use this all the time when performing a humble chi-square analysis. I'll often make sure when I set up the data that I, I'm exactly sure the way, way the data is. It's very useful to do this. Any comments or questions? Because we, we are out of time. I might just look at some of the um, uh, go quickly through the last little bit of code and maybe just look at some of the exercises that I'll leave for you to do. So uh, here was a challenge. I said, well, one challenge is set row names, the row names for matrix one using the row names function. So um, for that challenge, we can use row names for mat one. We can see there's nothing in it. But we could put row names, our own row names, in there. And they might be something like um, I, J, K, L. And we'd have to put them in double quotes or in quotes. I like single quotes. <clears throat> you can use double and single quotes interchangeably. I like single quotes because they take up less space. We put in our row names. I'm going to print out mat one down in the console. Three, two, one. <clears throat> now we have row names. Challenge two, make a matrix with three rows with the following vector so that the first column contains the numbers two, 
five and nine. The first column contains those numbers for rows one, two, and three. So the way we would do this is to use the matrix function. We have the help up. We would set the data equal to VEC2. Now here, we want the um, data to be populated by rows. So um, we'd use the by rows argument. Remember, it's cell set to um, false by default by row equals true. And we want it to have uh, three rows. In row equals three. So uh, I've see this little this little uh, warning that popped up. It's because I have this this extra comma in there. It's just giving me a little visual warning. That's a, that's a fairly new feature. All right, I'm just going to print this out. I'm not going to bother putting it in a data object. Three, two, one. Oops. Let me make the vector first. The butler told me the vector two is not found. Boom, boom. Now let's see if it adheres to my instruction. Make a, a matrix with three rows. This one has three rows. Following vector said so the first column contains two, five, and nine. Two, five, and nine. All right. <clears throat> um, that's it for the challenges. There are a few exercises here, just like normal. Uh, and I think the pattern that we'll do is I'll I'll do a little bit of a lecture to introduce the idea. I'll do live code for all the code in the um, in the uh, whole bootcamp page. But then I'll leave you for the practice exercises to work through on your own. And if you have problems with them, either use Slack if you're working at them through the week, and I'm, I'm happy to help in there. Go ahead and put them in the regular main channel rather than sending me a, a direct email, even if you're embarrassed. Put them out there so that other people can have a chance to respond and maybe they, are have, they have a similar question. They'll be interested. Um, or bring them next week to the, uh, to the next meeting. Any comments or questions before we, we call it today? All right, guys. Have a good night. I hope, uh, hope that, that was all clear starting with the data frame next week so um, I think we're really starting to get into some practical stuff next week so uh, I think the last two of these are uh, a little bit longer than these first couple of boot camps and we'll start going faster especially when we get into the stats ones in a couple of weeks so I'll I'll see you later have a good night